record to the cloud. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. Uh, so thank you all for coming back. And as you all know, this was uh, this was rescheduled. We had some technical difficulties on uh, my end. I think I think Rob might have had some in uh, at his place too. And we're we're both in our offices this evening, so we're we're trying to uh, plan around those uh, those issues. So. Uh, so thanks, Rob, for trying this again, and thank you all for coming back. Oh, you're welcome. And we had pretty good service at where I live near Cherokee, where I just spoke of, but uh, it seems like the last, uh, I don't know, the last couple of months, it, it's getting worse. And then I talked to a county official, and they said they're having some some pretty big issues with Verizon, so we're losing service in certain parts of our county now. So... But I appreciate everybody coming. This this is a a, a really interesting uh, topic. I think it's all, it can it, it's a passion as well for me because I've been involved in weather watching since probably the age of nine or ten. Uh, it goes back a while, and my job currently is the county extension director uh, for Jackson and Swain County for NC State University. Uh, we have a program, it's, it's weekly during the growing season and monthly during the uh, winter months with uh, USDA. And each county extension office is supposed to provide a ag crop weather report. I don't know, uh, Phil, do you do that or have you done that or know someone in, in your counties yes. that do that? Yes, they call us every Monday morning through the, through the growing season and we, uh, we submit that online. That, that same same thing for us. So I keep uh, precipitation. Uh, we uh, look at the crops, uh, the conditions of those. And the big uh, important thing with that is definitely uh, flooding, but more importantly is uh, drought and disaster relief. The USDA can see how those counties have really suffered uh, through a weather disaster or something as such. So we do that and it's uh, it's important. So I have a home weather station that is, <clears throat> the rain gauge is, uh, it meets world meteorological uh, standards. So that's a nice thing. And the weather station that I have, it, it, home weather station, it's a Davis and we'll, we'll show you some of that in a minute. It goes back, I've had it since uh, 1996, it was a Christmas gift. So, or 95, no 96, sorry. So let's get started, and there's a lot to it, a lot of things you can do to it. It can be a hobby. It's, it's a little part of my job, and it's something I enjoy uh, sharing. Rob, may I ask you a question? Yes. You're, um, I, I was here the last meeting, and I got to see whenever you showed the instruments in your home. Um, curiosity, ballpark figure in terms of price, because what I was looking at, I'm not sure that I saw what you have. But it, it looked like a good investment. Um, one thing I noticed that you talked about I don't have is the um, rain gauges and things of that nature. And yours was more um, obviously more specific with the Dave, Davis brand. But right. Just, do you recommend anything for someone just getting started? Well, and I'm going to go between I'm going to talk a little bit about the electronic and also kind of the old school. So you can go cheap and still get really accurate measurements or you can get really expensive. It's like anything, you know, you can get technical and spend thousands of dollars or you can go a um, couple hundred or you can go, you know, 50, 60 dollars and have a nice home weather station. So that's a good uh, point. Let me. Uh, and I'm looking right now. This is the book, one of the books y'all seen this uh, in the counties. It's Forestry Supplier. I'm sure uh, most of you have ordered from that if you've done any type of uh, wildlife, forestry, agriculture, uh, biological work. And I'm sure, Phil, you know this very much. So um, in, in this, let's see, 165. I'll give you a ballpark figure. And I haven't, I haven't priced it in years because mine's worked so well. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, 
hold that thought. Let me come back to that, okay? Let, let me, let's bring up the station and I'll tell you what it cost in 96, okay? So, Phil, can you help me um, bring up the fir one of the first slides and we'll go through these? Yes, I'll share the screen here and... Okay, so I'll tell you that this is called, this is where the, uh, okay, that is uh, the uh, the wind instruments part of the, of the Davis uh, Weather Monitor 2 station, and that is on top of the house, uh, my cabin. They're just south of Cherokee in a, a little community called Whittier. It's, it's in a valley. We sit about 2,100 feet. It is a cold pocket. This morning, we were probably in the 26, 27 in the afternoon. It probably got close to 70. So <clears throat> really uh, a bowl of microclimates. If you notice, uh, the brackets on the lower part, that uh, pole that the instrument arm is out on, is it has to be stabilized extremely well. Now, I would not, if I lived on the coast, uh, say Wilmington, North Carolina, or Cape Hatteras, this would probably not be suffice. This would this would blow away in a, in a probably a, a storm, definitely a hurricane. But we normally don't receive winds like that. We get gusts of 30 and 40, and and that's about it where I live. But the pole that it's on needs to be extremely as stable as possible. If not, it's going to sway, and you're going to get in inaccurate uh, measurements. So the three cups, that's called the anemometer. That measures your wind speed. And not to insult anybody, but that's kind of old school. Um, now they have different all kinds of instruments you can Google. And then, of course, the wind vane. And what you're seeing there is the tail. And then on the other end is the, the arrow. That is The arrow is pointing in the uh, direction of the wind. Okay. If you notice, this is wire. Um, this is not wireless. You can see the, the wire, the cable that runs around, that runs down into the house, and you can kind of see it go through the window there. Anytime that you're doing weather instruments, especially wind, that is about five foot, maybe now, nah, probably more like four, probably four foot above the roof line. You'll see weather stations that people buy, and it'll be uh, maybe a foot or two. You're going to get some really at inaccurate measurements. So you want at least at least three to four foot above that roof line, so you don't have a lot of obstruction with the wind and a lot of uh, things. So, and measuring uh, any type of weather vital is is extremely uh, difficult. Okay, and I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is just, you can see, I just want to get you a picture of the bracket. You can see that I had to build this out with a couple of, uh, looks like two by sixes, or two, I'm not sure what that is, but I had to get beyond that roof line. And then those brackets, I had to have two. If I didn't, there would be a lot of instability with that pole. And then you can see the wire running down. They do have wireless with these now. And I could probably upgrade this and do wireless, but I never have. The only thing that I've had to really, in 20, 26 years, is I've had the anemometer, I had to have the bearings replaced one time. And I sent that back to uh, Davis in, in Hayward, California. And they did it. I don't think it costs a lot. And um, it was back really quick. The service of Davis, I thought, was very well. And this has probably been about 10 years ago. So you can see the anemometer there. You can get a better picture of the, of the arrow and the tail. Okay. So that pipe is, is a steel pipe. It's, it's really strong. It's not, uh, it's not wood. You could use wood, but I use something a little bit heavier. So when the wind is blowing those instruments around and that arm that sticks out, that catch it acts like a, a sail it'll move that pole so you want it as stable as possible you can see there coming down the pole i don't want that cable flapping in the wind because it's going to eventually fray so i put some ties that you can buy at the hardware store and i'll come all the way down and that has been that way for about eight years now and i've had no problems so okay that's the wind instrument 
this is the inside component, uh, the weather station itself. This is where you see all the different um, uh, measurements. Uh, you got wind direction, you got wind speed, you got uh, outside temperature. I took this the other day, it was 59, as you can tell, Fahrenheit. You can change that to Celsius centigrade. You can even break it down into units. You can go to the 10th. Uh, you can get inside temperature, you can get dew point, you can get humidity, and you can see that all down there, temperature, wind. This is great, uh, Phil, by the way. Thank you very much. This is excellent uh, photo you did. Uh, wind chill. The wind chill on this is outdated. <laughs> they revised wind chill uh, some years ago. It was after uh, this, probably around 2000. Um, so the wind chill, it, it definitely reads much lower. Uh, the new uh, NOAA National Weather Service, uh, if it's 20 degrees and blowing 40 miles an hour in 1995, it would probably register like, you know, 35, 40 below. Well, that's, that was a little bit exaggerated. It's more like, you know, 10 or 15 below now. Rainfall that's accumulated over a period of a day, a month, annual, you have different uh, types of time span there. A barometer, uh, which is also very important, humidity, dew point, and then um, just like any little computer, you have enter, you have units, time, date, you have alarms. If you are a uh, grower, let's say you're a grower of uh, brambles or your orange grove grower in Florida, anything like that, and it's it's getting close to 35 degrees in the field, at, you know, and and you need to know when to cut that water on that alarm would go off. Of course, when you get into these big commercial crops, they got some very, they don't have one instrument, they have multiple instruments and they're very sophisticated. Um, scan, I don't use that a lot. Of course, time is, is day and time. And then you can clear and then you can do uh, the records there. So there's a lot of different things. That is the Davis Weather Monitor 2 and I'm almost positive they still sell that. The only thing that inside thing has had problems with, if you notice, on the northwest quadrant of the the wind thing right there, some years ago, and it's been within the last 10 years, it started developing this little bitty, um, it's almost like what you call when your eye gets, uh, what are they called, floaters? It started developing these floaters, and it's grown a little bit, but it's kind of stopped now. Don't know what caused that. I never did you know, send it back to correct it because it, it, it wasn't a big issue for me, but it could be for some others. So knowing the wind, uh, direction, the barometer, we'll get to that. That's really important. Okay. And this thing sits down. This is on a wall. I've got it mounted on a wall. That's the rain gauge. This is not ideal. This is uh, probably creates some inaccurate measurements and uh, don't want to get too much into that. That should be further out into a more open space, but I just don't have the, enough cable to go out or a good place. The reason I say that is you can see the the, the pitch, uh, the roof slanting down. If the wind's coming out, uh, this is on the north side of the house, as you can tell, the shade in the afternoon. The wind, if it's strong, it could create some uh, drifting of water droplets, that type of thing, and it could create some, some but it, it's good enough. It's not, um, I don't need, I'm not at the weather uh, bureau or anything, <laughs> but that's the rain gauge. It's a tipping bucket that does meet world meteorological standards. Sometimes though, leaves can get in there, uh, different types of things. You have to make sure it cleans out. So that should be more out in the open. Uh, if I was a, a cooperative weather observer, they'd want that out. If you notice down in the lawn and the grass, you see a blue uh, thing sticking up out of the ground with a white board. Does anybody know what that is? Any guesses? Snowboard. It Very like good. Oh, that, okay. That's so it's a, a weather gauge of some sort. <laughs> yeah, that's a homemade snowboard. And you may have read that. And you can go to NOAA and you can find out a lot of what I'm talking about. They can give you all kinds of education. But that's a snowboard. And I, I got it out in an area where it won't uh, blow and drift too much. 
So I record the snowfall and then that's a snow uh, measurement, but I also have a snow stick that's made of uh, steel there on the porch that I go out and measure as well. We hadn't had much snow, maybe eight, nine inches off for the year. So you can tell there's quite a few trees around uh, that will create, of course, I did the best I could. If you're measuring wind uh, officially, like at an airport, I mean, it's got to meet 30 meter standards. It's got to be away from any obstructions. That's why I'm saying to, to measure weather uh, vitals officially is uh, can be very difficult, but I did the best I could here. And you notice that rain gauge is on a board. Well, I didn't want it uh, tipping. I wanted to, to level it off, so I used a, uh, an, uh, what do you call it? They use in carpentry. Plum, I basically plumbed it to, to be as even as possible. Okay, Phil, let's go to the next. This um, this is up on this is actually in downtown near downtown Cherokee. In fact, you see downtown Cherokee over there, and to the right in your picture of those two uh, white pines is a remote weather instrument. Now this right here is is a remote station this thing you could i'm not sure why they put it there i i have a guess that the hospital is to my back of this picture and the fly zone for mama is coming east from Asheville. i think they probably want to get some weather vitals uh, before they land there on top of the hospital but that right there is uh that's not a couple hundred dollars for sure that's measuring a lot of different things. You can see the uh, temperature gauge, the white thing at the bottom. Of course, there's an anemometer in the cup and uh, the rain gauge and everything, but they cleared out. They did they did a pretty good job there. Um, that's probably 30 meters above the ground and they've got it cleared out. So they're gonna get some good accurate measurements to that. And that can be remote, um, what they call remote uh, RAWS, R-A-W-S. They could be using it as well for fires, uh, dew point winds that type of thing but that's a if you really want to spend a lot of money get you one of those and you'll be you'll be fancy i mean your neighbors will say my goodness this person's like national weather service hey phil can you go back to the first thing with the uh the white uh comb honeycomb on the keep on one two more two more one more Yeah, right there. Thank you. So this is on the north side of the house. Is this ideal? It is in the winter months because I don't get sun and I don't get uh, convection hitting the cabin. If you notice the white thing, they call that a honeycomb. And then the wires running in that, that's measuring temperature, dew point, and humidity. So that is uh, allows airflow around the, uh, the bulb that's measuring those, those weather vitals. And you can see the cable. I've got cables running everywhere, don't I? And that's running into the cabin. And then you can see it by the window there. You can see an old school thermometer. That's that's one of my bathrooms. But that right there is, uh, this is why recording temperatures is extremely difficult. <clears throat> that should be placed out. Uh, I don't know how many, it's, 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 it's maybe 100 feet from any structure. It should have air, not only that, it should have uh, airflow through there, a motor with a fan blowing to get really, truly accurate temperatures uh, measurement. But I put it back there. It's in the shade. It's good enough for me. But if you see if you see anything at the um, an airport or anything that needs very official or uh, with all the climate change things, this is one thing with the climate change. We we won't get into that measuring temperature is it is not easy it is uh accurate it to be accurate you really have to know what you're doing but the old cotton box the things that used to see um just google cotton weather box those are pretty accurate because they have good airflow they're open and they're old school instruments and uh we've moved away from that but a lot of cooperative observers there's about ten thousand, and even the united states that they they still measure it uh, physically, some's gone electronic. They're moving more that way. But that right there is a is a very 
important piece of instrument. Okay. All right. I think that was the last slide on that part. So all that came, all that with the Davis weather instrument, weather monitor too, it came with the wind instrument, the wind vane, the anemometer, the uh, thermometer. I did order that white honeycomb that came with the rain gauge and all the cables. And now I've ordered extra cables to connect with couplets. You can do that just because I had large areas I need to cross because I just, I couldn't, even on a small cabin that I have, you couldn't exactly, uh, one length of cable wasn't enough. So, so going back, let me, let me go in here real quick and see the instruments. Let me see if I can find some weather instruments. I'll give you some prices. If I can find it. You can go to Davis Weather Instruments and see what they've got now. You can also go to Forestry Suppliers. They're really good. Is Ben Meadows out of business, Phil? I haven't gotten a Ben Meadows catalog in several years, but I don't know for sure if they're out of I, business. Or not. I think Forestry Suppliers bought them out, but I'm not. I think that's what happened, but I'm not positive. Okay, so let's get into this stuff here. Let's just see what a I can't find it. But that rain gauge that I have, I think it uh that whole system that I have at the time in ninety six, I looked it up, it was around two hundred and fifty dollars. And I've added a few extra things, you know, fifty, sixty dollars here, extra cables. Cables didn't cost much, so that was that whole system's probably was around three hundred twenty-five plus years ago, which I thought was very expensive, but an extremely nice gift. Um, but you don't have to go that route. You can still go to the hardware store and buy small rain gauges, which will be accurate because. It's all based on, um, you know, measurements. You can even make your own home weather gauge, but that's a small one. You could put on a fence post out in the open in the field and get really good measurements with that. Um, temperatures, okay. You can even get minimum maximum thermometers that you can use and get that. You don't have to have it electronic. This does not have minimum uh, maximum things, but you can find those relatively inexpensive. This was developed by the U.S. Air Force when they're out in very remote areas. Uh, it's called the wind meter, the dire, and it can measure. There's a little cotton ball. You see the little cotton ball there? Let's see here. That little cotton ball, uh, the wind blows in the back in these two holes, and then it goes up and down. That right there today, one of those costs $25. So, and then you have a little cleaner, you can get little extra cotton balls as well. That's a really good thing to have if you're out doing something with drones. They use this on uh, remote stations back in, I think, in World War II, different places, so they could get wind speed. Kids love this thing. They love to see it. We teach fifth graders soil and water. So that's a nice little thing. And it's it's old school. It's 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 engaging. It's interactive. It's not electronic. This is a little instrument, just a little wind vane. OK, you, you need to know uh, what direction these go on small sailboats. And you can I can clip that on a little thing. I have a little pole and I can hold it up and get wind direction. If I'm out, you know, somewhere where I don't have electronics, simple, very, can be very accurate. Okay. That didn't cost probably a 10 or 10 or $12. I got that from a selling company. Any home weather station has some kind of little book. Um, if you don't have instruments, so what? You can go to a... Uh, Has anyone ever heard of the Buford scale, Buford wind scale? OK, 
Can anybody see that? Very good. Thank you. So the Buford wind scale, you can look at smoke, you can look at leaves, you can look at branches, um, and you can gauge uh, the wind speed by observations on the landscape or the sea. Uh, General Bu Buford, bad, Admiral Buford, I guess, he, this was way back in the 1800s. <clears throat> so that's very accurate for the land. They have one for the sea too, in open water, like the Great Lakes. So that's really, that's good, the Buford scale. So you don't even have to have that. You don't even have to have a wind vane. You could use a uh, light string or maybe some type of very light ribbon attached to uh, a limb or something or a pole. Definitely, you can look at flags, schoolyards, the American flag, the state flag, whatever flag, you can look at that. And every home weather station needs a cloud chart. Okay, this, I'll, I'll give you a little, uh, it's a nice hobby to have. So if you know the clouds over a sequence of hours, say six to 12 to 12 to 24 hours, and you know the wind direction, you can do what they call single station weather forecasting. Okay. And you have the high, in any cloud chart, you'll have the high level clouds on the top of the chart, the middle level clouds. Can everyone see okay? Then yes. you have the lower level clouds. Okay. So the cirrus clouds are the high, the alto or middle, and the cumulus and stratus are low. Fog is basically a ground level stratus cloud. So pretty soon we're going to be starting moving back into the cumulus uh, with the, uh, the bellowing, uh, the uplift. We're going to start seeing that here any week. So those have been absent. So this came from a company in Richmond, and it was uh, it's called Cloud Chart Incorporated. And these guys will send you out. It's a mom and a daughter. Uh, the daughter, the mom, the daughter's dad started this company some years ago. He has passed, but these guys will send you some super laminated, nice uh, weather charts. This is one I can take out in the field because it's laminated. So if you look at the back, if I know the type of cloud, and I watch the clouds over a sequence of hours to a day, I can make a, a, a forecast 12 to 24 hours. Have y'all ever, ever heard of a single station weather forecasting? It's a lot of fun. Kids love it. It gets them out from the computer and gets them outside and looking up. And I won't go too much into this, but um, barometer, reading a barometer is, that's also another very difficult thing. The old school. Does anybody know what this is called? What type of barometer? Class. Is it an aneroid? It is an aneroid. So this is old school too. This goes back to the 1700s. No, I'm joking. <laughs> this probably goes back to the, I think the 60s. This was dad's barometer. Um, Anytime you use an aneroid barometer, definitely put it on sea level. Because if it's not on sea level and it's on station pressure, your elevation, you're not going to be able to care, uh, compare and contrast your barometer with the rest of the world as far as sea level. All barometers should be uh, calculated to sea level. This operates on a vacuum, and you can see the vacuum in there with air pressure rising and falling. And it, that little... Um, drum in there expands it and retracts based on um, thing. Make sure you also, if you have an older house or something, you get one that's temperature compensated because the temperature goes up and down. That can create a lot of issues of uh, inaccuracy on reading a barometer. So does anybody have an Android barometer at home? No, I don't. Okay. So there's, there's a store in Massachusetts, uh, it's called the Weather Store, the Weather Shack. They sell uh, a lot of instruments. They have some instruments that go back 100 years and they restore them. But you can see some really neat ones of these. And on the back of this, you see a little bitty uh, area where a uh, screwdriver, a little small screwdriver, that's where you set the needle to sea level pressure. And how you get that, just go to your your nearest weather service. Um, if you're in near uh, 
probably that would be Bristol there, Phil, for you. If you're near Kentucky, it might be Jackson, East Kentucky, Jackson, and just try to get it as close as possible and then put it there. The black needle is what's going. This this thing is what you set it after you, you sometimes you have to tap these lightly. Okay, and it'll go rise or fall. And then you move this thing and set it because then next time you check it six hours from now, 12 hours from now, you'll know if it's going up or down. This is a Jason. Th these are, uh, I think these companies still around. For barometer principles, it's probably as complicated as measuring accurate temperature. Uh, the atmosphere, just like the ocean, has rises and falls like tides. And if the barometer is falling during the day, a certain percent, a certain uh, amount, that that that's pretty normal. If it's rising during the evening, it's fairly normal. But what you want to do is compare these barometer. Um, what do they call it? It's a uh, diurnal variation in pressure characteristics. Then you can compare that to what's happening. Is it really rising or falling or is it really normal? OK, that takes some some practice, but those are called uh, barometer principles. And you can see the red line. So the red line is what is normal, but you see the black line is, is it rising slowly, rising uh, uh, slowly, rising rapidly, falling slowly, falling rapidly. Or is it steady? Okay. Does that make sense? This may be more than you want. So those are barometer principles, and I can uh, I can always send that to you. Let's see what else? Um, oh. The company I talked about in Richmond, Virginia, the cloud chart. This is a larger one that I have on the wall here in the office. I have one at home too. This is just bigger. I've also laminated as well, and I take it out and use it with the youth. So that's the same thing as the one I showed you. But if you do get a cloud chart, you know, get a good one. Get one. These are good, and it also get one that has the uh, the forecast with the wind direction and the cloud type. And with that, you can make a reasonable prediction of 12 to 24 hours. And then you compare that to the uh, National Weather Service or AccuWeather and see how they do. Of course, you're not going to be able to really tell temperature because that's that gets a little more complicated. Temperature is complicated. Y'all know that's the lesson tonight. Temperature is complicated. Uh, any questions? Somebody's laughing. Hey, when, you, uh, <laughs> when you talk about um, wind direction, you know, like they say, southerly winds, is that the direction that it's going or is it the direction that's coming from? Direction it's coming from. I'll give you an example. Here's the little wind vane. This is the tail. This is the arrow. That is pointing in the direction the wind is coming from. If my if my finger right here is southerly, this finger's northerly, the wind is coming from the south. Okay. Okay, and if it's that way, my diagram, I don't know how you all can see, the wind's coming from the north. This tail, pretend like y'all are the wind, the, the wind is pressing that back and forth, right? The wind is coming down, hits it, and that points it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a very common uh, question a lot of people have. They have gotten so sophisticated now. Temperature, wind, wind speed, wind direction, barometer. And y'all have probably seen these already. They have a couple little sticks on an instrument, and all the vitals are measured on that. Have y'all seen those? You see them on interstates now. You see them uh, different places. I don't like them because nothing's moving. You don't see anything. All these guys, a little stick, about that size, literally. 
Well, that's no fun. Nothing's moving. Of course, I don't think you'll go out, go out and buy that because that I don't know. I'm having to tell them what that would cost. Any other questions? So any home weather station. And I think Davis is probably the best. I really do. Their service has been excellent. Uh, home weather station is going to have wind direction, wind speed, uh, precipitation measurement, uh, thermometer, uh, dew point, humidity. Uh, also have a cloud chart. Have some literature. Barometer, whether it's electronic. I like these because I can see something moving. I'm just kind of old school because that's the way I am. And like something on the wall. And then any type of uh, barometer principles are, are really good to have. Hey, Rob, there used to be an extension agent over in Pottville, Kentucky. And before he came to extension, he'd been in the Air Force. And it was just really uh, passionate about weather. And he, he published a book. It was called The, uh, the Do-It-Yourself Book of Weather. And mm -hmm. uh, it was... Uh, if I remember right, it was 1979, and, and you could still get it as of recently on Amazon. Um, are there other resources that you would recommend uh, as far as? I, you, <clears throat> did, um, what's the one uh, field that does all the, the botany, the trees? Oh, the uh, Peterson? Uh, Peterson Field Guides, they make an excellent one. And that gets more in depth. This is this is definitely more elementary, definitely uh, not as detailed. It just kind of, you know, talks about the different fronts and things. This would be more for uh, grade school. Okay. Another thing I didn't show you without, if you didn't have a cloud chart, but a good, listen to this, a good barometer and, and wind direction if you really watch uh, the barometer in the wind over a period of hours, you can make a, uh, and if you know the barometer principles, you can make a forecast also 12 to 24. If you put, if you couple this with a cloud chart, you can even do better. It's about uh, having more uh, data, wind speed or wind direction, barometer direction and clouds. Here in the, and I'll say this here in the mountains, and, and no different from where you folks are, whether you're Blacksburg or East Kentucky, Southwest Virginia, East the Smokies here in West Carolina, we have a, so many microclimates, so many different uh, eddies with the wind. Uh, we have just it's it's it can be really difficult, which you've know you know that, and uh, it creates uh, you know we're mid latitudes, but we're kind of the we're we're starting to approach more the they're lower to mid latitude. So storm tracks are funny. You know, they're not out there around the Great Lakes where it's really rocking and rolling. Um, so it's an interesting place to live because our mountains create a lot of different weather situations. But Peterson's, yeah. Uh, speaking of mountains, I I'll plug another, another resource. One of our master naturalists, Wayne Browning uh, from, uh, from here in the area. He runs a website called the Appalachian uh, Climate Center, and uh, and I just pulled it up. He, he's it's really weather focused. That's uh, influenced by High Knob, which I know you're you're familiar with High Knob here in Wise County. But I'll read the the welcome on his website. It says the Appalachian Climate Center is is especially designed for those who live, work, play, and travel through the famed mountain empire of Southwest Virginia, Southeast Kentucky. Northeast Tennessee and Northwest Carolina with focus being centered upon the great high knob masses. So, uh, so a lot of, a lot of detail on there. And he, I know he puts a lot of blood, sweat and tears into that, that website. If anybody has ever visited that. Yeah. High, high knobs, a weather maker and, and, and between Norton and high knob, uh, major weather differences. Same as between Mount LeConte and Gatlinburg. Very big weather differences for the east. Right. Oh, y'all, I was talking about here's a picture. I was just looking here. Uh, this is what they call the old cotton box. I think that was called the cotton box because it was developed in the south. 
uh, in the co cotton plantations to get accurate temperatures. Okay. I'm trying to find, I can't find it. Y'all might just Google Davis weather instruments and see what they're charging. Rain gauges. Hey, you can go to the hardware store and buy these all day. You can go to the website or the forestry suppliers and find all different ones. Make sure the water is out during the winter months or it'll freeze in there and crack and then you'll have to go buy another one. I uh, We get a catalog too, and I'm sure you do as well. Uh, it's, it's NASCO. And, yes, uh, yes. and while you're talking, I pulled one of those out and it's really not, um, of course this, the one I, I grabbed was the science education NASCO catalog. There's really nothing nothing as good as what's in forestry suppliers. A lot of, a lot of things like you were saying, uh, that, you know, that you might use in classroom and that kind of thing, but nothing, mm -hmm. nothing real impressive in that. Hey y'all, I just found it here. Here's Davis. Okay. Right. And this, th it's, they're carrying the Vantage Pro 2. That's a, that's a, that's a, a quality of step up from what I have. And if you buy a cabled one, it's six hundred and seven dollars. If you buy a wireless, it's six fifty two. Is so it's increased three times in twenty five years. Uh, but you're getting you're getting more for your money because there's just more stuff on it, and the, and the technology is just so much better. But the reliability and the quality of Davis is I, I'm, I've been impressed. There are other good ones out there. There's one right here called, uh, I just looked through it. Onset, it's called a hobo. That's for more remote. That may be, that's definitely a great up. But Davis is really known for home weather stations. That's kind of what they're known for. This instrument, the onset, you're looking at over two, $2,200, you know, $2,200. So there's a lot of uh, stuff going on there. That would be more for somebody in big, large agriculture operations. Right. I'll stop there. All right, very cool. Uh, any any questions? Any more questions for Rob? Weather watching is fun, and, and try to you know get get some things, get some cloud charts, get some uh, weather instruments, and and get your uh, you know your grandkids or students out there or church groups whatever you got in your county i, I think it gives a uh, it gives them something to do besides looking at electronics all the time that's now i was now growing up my oldest sister says god rob you're really weird you're a nerd <laughs> i didn't care what they thought then nor <laughs> I think it's fascinating to study. Um, I'm, I'm not great at it by any means, but uh, especially on windy days, I just cannot wait to check to see how high the wind speed was here at the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And where do you live? I live in Wise County and I actually live um, in the shadow of High Knob, I guess is a good way to describe that mm. because uh, actually just beyond my house, as you're going towards High Knob, um, I, I live down in the Coburn community. Um, okay. So High Knob is, um, I'm, I'm at roughly 2,100 feet and they're on up the mountain from me. Yeah, I, I know exactly where you are. Hey, uh, what year was that that I ran that race up there, Phil? What, seven, eight years ago? Uh, I, I think it was sooner than that, maybe 2018 or so. Yeah, okay. Wow. Okay, when is that? Was that, the, um, was that in Coburn? Uh, cloud splitter oh no the cloud splitter that's in norton which is just down this um it's in the same community well that, coburn and Norton's two different places but yeah i understand there was a real interesting weather situation going on and i knew what was happening it was during the fall right phil it was like mm -hmm. october yep. in october yep. Yep. it's always and october. There, there there was a southeasterly wind coming up on the east side of, of High Knob, the massive there, and it was cresting and then crashing down towards the Norton side. I mean, it, remember how windy it was up there, Phil, and it was coming down? Yeah. yeah. That was basically uh, a Chinook. That was mm -hmm. a Fanon. And that's what the big winds that, remember when Gatlinburg, the winds caught, uh, got mm -hmm. really high and blew the fires off the mountain and took down power lines? Right. Yep. That's exactly what was happening that night. 
doesn't have to be the Rocky Mountains. It happens in Appalachia. Right. A lot of strong winds were coming through there that night. I remember that. And that was a front pre-fernal. And it's always interesting here in terms of weather that you could be here in Coburn. And as I said, our town is, our town sits at just below 2,000 feet. It's like 1990 something. Um, anyway, then of course, the high knob there over 4,000. So you can be in town and it'd be a beautiful, warm day with no need for a coat or anything. And of course, as you ascend the mountain, you're going to go down uh, 10 to 15 degrees by the time you get to the top because of the elevation change. Yeah. And, uh, it, you can see some unique and, and like uh, Ramos and stuff like that. I'm, I'm sure, Philip, you probably see that more than I do, because when you're coming from pound towards wise, you can see the mountain, you see the yeah. the, the caps and stuff. Right. Yeah. You can get all kinds of uh, weather uh, measurements and observations just right if you just go to uh, noaa.gov right. and you know that comes up and then you click on weather the national weather service click on southwest virginia or east kentucky or northeast tennessee um and your office is out of blacksburg i think phil for where you are you can look on there you got cooperative observers in your area you got cuckoo ross uh precipitation folks you got all kinds of things there that you may not even be aware of that you can get see what's happened snowfall rainfall temperature wind speed storm nationalweatherservice.gov just click on when that american map comes up us map just click on your area okay great and you can be a home weather watcher <laughs> It's like bird it can be like bird watching it's just it's a hobby but it's a healthy hobby you know and hobbies are important yes they are i was going to say i'm a, i was going to say i'm a teacher so believe me i watch the weather yeah and i'm sure y'all all you know your educators your oh, oh no no it has nothing to do with that it's about praying for snow days <laughs> <laughs> hey if you're like here it, it's just the forecast of snow anymore <laughs> you, you gotta go you gotta know when to go buy bread and milk <laughs> <laughs> yep very true all right rob again thank you very much for for uh, doing this as a, mm -hmm. uh, a as a as a backup uh, since since we had some issues the first time this has been great appreciate that yeah. and, uh, and thanks to you all thank for you and y'all listen, you can reach out to me, get a hold of 